gosh, probably June of 2020, Melanie had shared, you know, we're all sort of isolated and we've all been a part of so many things in the past. And how can we get back together and, you know, not only share what is happening from those previous initiatives, but just feel connected and feel a part of everything that we're all working to achieve. And also, how do we welcome new advocates and new individuals that want to be advocates and find their voice? And so that's this whole session has been designed that way to uh, share uh, the examples of what's happened in the past, um, the outcomes of what that is creating already. And then as I wrap up the session uh, at the end of today, uh, just under an hour and a half from now, uh, we'll have more information about the working groups and the outcomes we're going to work towards in 2021. Everybody has said how we really want to be a part of change and what is advocacy's role in leading that change. And so what I'll share towards the end of the session is how we'll co-create that together based on the areas that are most important to this group and everybody involved. And then at the end of the year, have something we're proud of and can tangibly share as the results of what we're building together. So without any further ado, uh, I have the deep honor of introducing our first speaker. And I'll just say that uh, Melanie and I, I believe met uh, at the beginning of last year and she has quickly become uh, somebody I respect tremendously um, and I'm honored to follow in her footsteps. So uh, please everyone mel welcome Melanie Truehills. Dave, thank you so much for the great introduction and for all the work that you've done to make the COVID advocacy exchange so powerful for those of us who are advocates. So to talk a little bit about um, how this came about, Dave and I uh, connected um, early last year and I shared that this was not BMS's first rodeo. This was not the first time they've been really engaging of patient advocates. And that I felt that it would be valuable for us to know what had happened with some of those prior initiatives and to be able to celebrate those successes as we work to move forward together and collaborate. So I'm thrilled that we are talking about that subject today. And uh, I was asked to give a little bit of background about my organization and my work, and then to talk about some of those things that we've done together with BMS. So first, I'm an atrial fibrillation patient. Um, atrial fibrillation is also called AF or AFib. And in the US, we tend to call it AFib. AFib is an irregular heartbeat that totally disrupts your life. And it can also lead to heart failure, stroke, dementia, and even death. So after almost two years of living with the disruption and the fear that AFib causes, I um, had a surgical procedure and I became AFib free. And I knew that I couldn't stand on the sidelines and watch other people suffer with AFib like I had. So in 2007, I started StopAFib.org, patient advocacy organization focused on giving people who live with AFib their lives back. And I knew at the time that AFib was the most common unknown condition, um, at least a common unknown heart condition and more than 33 million people worldwide live with this condition. So I knew that we needed to do something to raise awareness of it. And we created Atrial Fibrillation Awareness Month and then worked with some medical societies and went to Congress and got the US Senate to declare September as National Atrial Fibrillation Awareness Month. Now, our work includes um, our, web, our educational website, stopafib.org, a peer support discussion forum. We have AFib master classes. We are in the midst of our Get Back to Care webinar series um, that will go you know, for several more months. And we also uh, just finished our annual Get in Rhythm, Stay in Rhythm Atrial Fibrillation Patient Conference, which features three days of talks and, and discussion with the world's top AFib expert doctors. 
I also speak worldwide at medical conferences, helping clinicians understand what it's like to live with atrial fibrillation and have been part of consensus document and guideline writing groups over the years. Over the years, we've also worked on many global initiatives and in, including some involving Neil. And um, one of the global initiatives we've been part of was Action for Stroke Prevention, which involved medical societies as well as some patient organizations, including the Atrial Fibrillation Alliance, Anticoagulation Europe, the International Alliance of Patient Organizations, and my organization. We also were part of stop, or excuse me, of Sign Against Stroke and Atrial Fibrillation, which was patient advocacy organizations coming together to drive awareness of AFib and stroke. We had uh, more than 100 organizations that were signed on to our charter, and we held global and regional patient organization summits in Munich, Budapest, Lisbon. Bogota, Kuala Lumpur, Helsinki, and Warsaw. I had the privilege of co-chairing the Sign Against Stroke and Atrial Fibrillation Task Force and leading a working group that focused on patient engagement materials that were then localized into local languages. So now, even more importantly, let me talk about some of the things that we've been involved with with BMS. So it's been a great privilege to be able to speak at some internal town halls to share the patient experience with folks at BMS. Um, BMS has also done atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation advocacy summits for many, many years. And these annual events bring together patient advocacy organizations and medical societies to collaborate. And there've been many very powerful collaborations that have come out of those summits. There was also the global undiagnosed atrial fibrillation meeting, uh, which was held in Amsterdam in um, about 2016, I believe. And that was uh, focused on groups coming from around the globe to work on atrial fibrillation and stroke prevention, um, you know, awareness. And um, there was another really important initiative that we were part of, and that was a co-creation workshop that was held in 2018. And that was a follow-on from a um, smaller co-creation workshop that was held a few few years earlier. And these co-creation workshops were focused on developing patient-friendly package inserts for medications. And that was one of the things that I wanted to know that I mentioned to Dave that I wanted to know a lot more about what had come out, what had happened in other disease states with BMS um, as a result of the work that we did. And one of the most important BMS initiatives that I've had the privilege to be part of was back in 2018, uh, BMS's global advocacy meeting. That was where the CEO of BMS and the C-suite sat on the front row, listening to representatives of seven patient organizations talk about the patient experience and their work. And the goal was to find ways for BMS and advocacy organizations to collaborate more effectively. And it was truly a privilege to be part of this with executives wanting to really understand patient needs. So it's been a great journey um, with BMS involved in some of these patient-friendly, patient-facing initiatives. And I'm really thrilled that we had the opportunity to showcase some of those kinds of things today and to celebrate the successes as we set the stage for the collaboration that we hope will happen this year. So let me, let me turn it back to, um, to Dave to uh, introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Melanie. It's um, amazing to, to see this coming to life now from the idea seeds back the middle of next year. 
Um, and just to emphasize, this session is really about um, sharing those collaborations. And so our third speaker uh, will share some of the results that are happening because of the input that Melanie's talking about and the advocate voice. So, um, but before we get to Brian, I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, uh, Maria Dutarte from UPATI. And uh, Maria is gonna share what her work is and then as we get towards the end of the session, um, this is all about sharing resources and making sure we're setting up for this year. Um, and so there'll be more at the end too. So uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dave. I'm, I feel really privileged uh, of being here today. So my name is Maria Dutarte and I represent the European Patients Academy, which is an organization based in the Netherlands. And we are, I myself, I'm uh, in, based in France and, and we are an international team scattered all around Europe. And we are also, we have national platforms in 23 countries already in Europe and in Japan. Um, and what we do, we, uh, uh, we enhance the capacity of patients to be valuable contributors in the medicines R&D processes. And we do this by providing training on the, on the process of, of medicines development, all the different elements that are in involved from clinical trials to HCA processes to regulatory affairs and so on. And also what we we um, include in the training uh, the different endpoints where patients can be involved and, and engaged in, in, in the medicines R&D processes. So it's a, a non-disease specific training and we invite uh, patient advocates from different fields to join our training and to become um, empowered patient experts. And we have been doing this since 2012. And we are a multi-stakeholder um, public-private partnership. So we work with um, patient organizations, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and also academic organizations. And we have close contacts with HTA bodies and regulatory agencies as well. And so all of our course materials and trainings are co-created with patients and with the other stakeholders. And we, uh, in, in um, addition to the course, we also provide uh, publicly available information about the medicines R&D processes and patient engagement through our toolbox, which is freely available on our website that you can see in, in the chat. And the toolbox is uh, available in 13 languages now. We have also added Japanese, if that is of interest for, for anyone. Also Spanish uh, is available. And we, as I mentioned, we have national platforms all around Europe and now in Japan too. And these platforms replicate the, the, the UPATI activities in the, at the national level. So we also have uh, patient expert training courses, for example, in the Netherlands and in Italy and in Ireland, and they have been tailored to the national context. Um, what we see uh, also is an important part of our work is training the, the other stakeholders about patient engagement, um, preparing the ground for our expert patients. We have seen that um, also professionals from the, the industry and academic organizations can benefit from uh, co-designed trainings and workshops with patients to understand better what it really means in their work to implement patient involvement. Um, we have also um, looked into the impact of our training for patients and we have conducted annual surveys among the, the trainees and what we see that um, it is quite impressive that after they have um, concluded the 14 month course, which we call the UPATI patient expert training course, and they graduate as so-called UPATI fellows, they, their involvement in advising pharmaceutical companies or HTA bodies or regulatory agencies goes up to 30 or 40 percent. So they are really um, um, empowered in their advocacy, but also in their involvement in different projects such as focus group discussions or reviewing protocols uh, uh, or um, 
clinical trial, um, yeah, clinical being involved in clinical trials. We also see that interestingly, uh, after this, this training, many of them become um, even more involved in their patient organizations. So they take on often leadership roles, having been strengthened by this, this base, base of knowledge and also the opening towards international collaboration. So we see that this is also true for many of our UPATI fellows is that they become uh, active at the international level and European level. Um, so in, this is us in a nutshell, and it hasn't been an easy year. I would say 2020 uh, really uh, helped us to focus also on our main um, core, core uh, activities. And the mission became even more clearer that, that uh, it is important to train and educate patients and provide those training opportunities. And we moved everything online. So we had to quickly adjust to uh, our uh, from having given, being given face-to-face -face trainings for over eight years, we had to quickly adjust to uh, e-learning mode and live streaming uh, workshops. And um, surprisingly, the response was very positive. So we um, find that um, uh, our um, patients who were our trainees adapted very well and uh, adjusted to the Zoom uh, and other platforms that we, we uh, were working through and um, appreciated the, the training and the interactivity that was provided by these, these tools. And this was also rewarding to see that there, there was a sense of need to get together even uh, you know during digital digitally like this even if we of course miss the face to face contact we also saw that uh, there was a, a um, growing interest for e learning and so um, uh, we have really focused on de further developing our e learning uh, platform which i will speak about a bit later so this is us in, in, a, in a quick summary, and I'm happy to answer more questions later. Thank you so much, Maria. May, may I ask you, uh, before we introduce Brian, um, when anybody asks me now um, how I learned or how I got involved, my answer is always, I made a lot of mistakes. And I tried to annoy a lot of people to learn from them. A lot of you are probably on this meeting right now. Um, what is it like for you to see people who want to learn more about how medicines are development and participate in that. What is it like to see them go from curious, but not really understanding to being trained and certified and actually moving things forward? Yes, there, this, this is an amazing journey for, for many individuals, starting with um, lots of questions and, and questioning also their role and then seeing that others are taking that journey as well and being encouraged by those great examples that we have in the community and then understanding that they can also do this and they can learn the, the most difficult uh, um, uh, you know, the most difficult content that we have in the core statistics and all these kind of uh, details that maybe uh, individuals have never, these piece, people have never looked into and, and are, these are really challenging topics and, and uh, content. But I think um, if the motivation is there, there, there is a way, there is always a way. And uh, then, then finally, when they have this, this certificate in hand and the graduation moment comes, the, this, the joy is just overflowing. So I, I, this is also what is so rewarding in my job just to be able to see this and facilitate the, the, this kind of uh, work. That's wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Um, I heard you mention at least two times co-creating and collaborating, and I feel like that's a perfect uh, handoff to Brian, um, because no matter who we are or where we are, change only happens by working together. And just so honored to introduce Brian Lee from Bristol Myers Squibb to talk about, Brian, the things you're doing and what that's creating. Thanks, Dave. I'll, I'll just start by saying what an honor it is to participate on this panel. 
um, really, really grateful for the opportunity and to, and to speak with such passionate individuals such as uh, Melanie, Maria, and Neil. Um, so for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brian Lee on the global advocacy team within Bristol Myers Squibb. Uh, pharmacists by training have, have done quite a bit of um, clinical work, uh, policy work, um, and advocacy work at uh, other companies prior to joining BMS. Um, in the all, probably close to 10 years I've been in advocacy, almost four of which have been at BMS. I've, I've seen such great changes and evolution within the patient advocacy space, uh, even in the last four years that I've been at BMS. And, and so today I wanted to take an opportunity and, and share with you one of the initiatives that uh, I've led with the support of a number of individuals, both within BMS as well as outside, um, that officially launched in 2020, which we were calling PEER, uh, P-E-E-R, which stands for Patient Expert Engagement Resource. And um, PEER is, is really a, a system or initiative at BMS that we've developed over the last couple of years with uh, a, a number of internal teams. I think we had maybe 16 uh, internal BMS teams that we worked on uh, with PEER, as well as patient advocacy organizations across our entire uh, portfolio and, and therapeutic areas. And so um, what PEER is, is an initiative to uh, more systematically and, and consistently engage with expert patient advocates to seek their input into our programs uh, throughout the entire life cycle of, of the drug. What that means is we're looking to get input from these expert patient advocates as early as possible through as late as possible. And, and we can sh we'll certainly share some of the results and, and metrics. Um, so you know, PEER was really launched internally in May of 2020. So it's less, less than a year old, about you know, seven months or so. Um, we, we even announced it externally on, on BMS.com in September. And through PEER, um, with the support of really some of our executive leadership team, we've been able to get input into our pivotal or registrational trial protocols um, in, in 2020. In fact, our chief medical officer, Summit Hirawat, actually mandated that all of our pivotal trial or registrational trial protocols be reviewed by expert patient advocates before he signed off on them. And that to me was such a huge demonstration of support from our leadership, something that we could not have um, really succeeded in, in peer with, without that support. Maybe just, just a quick side note in, uh, in my experience in an advocacy, um, there was a story where I, I had a colleague who wanted to get input into protocols um, from the patient population, the patient advocacy community. And, and the feedback they received was that while the, the chief scientific officer didn't believe that patients should provide input into protocols because protocols are you know, very, very technical, very, very scientific. And um, that experience you know, has always stuck with me um, and, and motivated me. Uh, you know, people who, who think that they know more than the patients they're working for or the people that are affected by the condition. Um, hopefully that, that's changed. That example was, uh, gosh, maybe, maybe six years ago now. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, there are, you know, much less people who, who think like that within the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I will say at BMS, the, the leadership is strongly supportive of patient and patient advocate feedback into our programs. So, so through peer, we've gotten input into not just our protocols, our um, clinical trial lay summaries, our commercial initiatives, communications campaigns, policy and access issues, as well as patient reported outcomes tools and, and health economics outcomes research. We really strive to include peer into everything that we're doing across the organization. Um, and I think it's provided a lot of value, even in the you know, less than a year, we've, we've done work in almost every single area that I've mentioned. And in 2021, we'll be looking to um, increase the robustness of peer in, in a number of areas um, some of which do include um, making uh, peer more robust within our diversity and inclusion uh, strategies, as well as health equities pillars. Um, so through peer, we've been working with patient groups, um, both within the U.S. as well as outside the U.S., so um, global organizations. And I, I think it's just done such a great job. Um, maybe a, a couple just quick examples um, to, to demonstrate the, the value of peer um, Internally, uh, there was a, a case study where for one of our trials, 
um, we actually had to uh, do an amendment for our protocol. And, and for those of you who don't know, uh, amendments for clinical trial protocols typically cost uh, a company anywhere from, from 1 million plus. And so um, the amendment actually addressed the uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, and I think that I would like to think that if, uh, if peer had been uh, operational at that time, maybe if we had gotten expert patient advocate feedback into our inclusion exclusion criteria for that program, we may have been able to avoid, you know, one or, or more amendments, effectively saving the company, you know, a million plus dollars. But also um, on, on the opposite side, it would definitely make the clinical trial more attractive to, to the patient community. Um, making enrollment, recruitment, retention much better, accelerating the development of the trial, and then, the, and then um, overall making sure the medicine is available to the patient community much earlier. Um, so really a win-win situation for everyone. Um, so I'm you know, really excited uh, for the evolution of PEER in, in 2021, and also to, to learn a bit more about um, where you as a participants and the speakers see the value of a program like PEER, what we can do to make it better. Um, both at BMS as, as well as across the industry. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it back to Dave to introduce uh, our good friend, Neil, who's also uh, on this panel. Yeah, and Brian, I, that's such a great example, not only because what's happening in peer is really tangibly changing things, but it's also a model, right? It's where collaboration really creates change. So I hope we keep that in mind, you know, as we have these conversations, where else can models like peer bring us together to do this kind of work to create change. Um, Brian, the last time I heard you speak at a panel, uh, you talked about being ghosted. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we, every, every one of us knows what it feels like to fight for change and feel like people aren't listening. But I'm guilty of forgetting that no matter where we are, that happens. What's it like for you being in industry and being someone who fights for change and sharing that knowledge? What, what is that like? Yeah, that's a great question, Dave. I, I will say, um, one, it's, it's tough. It's, it's definitely tough when you want to get that input from the patient community. And then sometimes um, team members don't see the value of it. But that's, you know, that's our job within the advocacy team, not just to connect with the patient communities, but also the internal advocacy piece, demonstrate the value that the patient input is bringing within our company, um, you know, there's a ton of value and impact that is bringing across the entire organization, um, no matter what the function is. And, and part of our job is to um, demonstrate that, to, to speak up and, and to share that as widely as possible. Um, so even though it's sometimes extremely challenging, it's incredibly rewarding, especially on some of these programs where we're getting patient input into a phase two programs programs that, you know, won't have approved medicines uh, for five or six years. And then to, to see where that input has come along that entire life cycle of the drug is, is it's incredibly amazing and, and rewarding. Uh, wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, Dave. Yeah, I think we all get frustrated. We want change to happen immediately. Um, and we want everybody to be believers. But um, I kept looking at my whiteboard. I just want to turn my camera. Um, I keep this written on my wall. Just one second, sorry. I keep this written on my wall to remind me all the time, every patient is an expert in their own chosen field, namely themselves and their own life. And I think about leaders like Janet Woodcock, you know, who says at the FDA that um, patients are the experts in our experience of the disease. And so the more people are really driving change like this, um, the, the more we'll make progress and be connected doing it. So um, thank you, Brian. And that is a perfect transition to uh, Neil Bertelson, who um, really, I think, Neil, you have a broad, not just geographically, but expertise view on all these things that are happening. So just honored to introduce Neil Bertelson to everyone. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. And, and thank you so much for inviting me to this panel. And I can see so many threads that flow through this panel as we've heard the speakers so far. And so um, I'm really delighted um, to be able to just share some thoughts um, with you over uh, one activity, a quite big activity that's happened over the last few years and delivered this year. But I'll just introduce myself first. So um, I've been a patient advocate since the early 1990s, but really over the last 15 years or more, um, I've been much more involved in how healthcare decisions are made, these multi-stakeholder decisions are made. Um, things like health technology assessment, you know, those decisions decide 
what medicines are often available within a public healthcare system. How are patients involved in that? So for the last 15 or more years, I've been involved in working with multiple stakeholders to try and understand how decisions are made and where patients can be a part of and an integral and a meaningful part of that decision-making process. Um, and so I've been involved in organizations like um, HTA International, which is the Scientific Society for Health Technology Assessment and Patient-Focused Medicines Development, which is a sort of multi-stakeholder global consortium looking at patient involvement in medicines development. Um, but you know what, 2020, what a harsh year, what a really, really harsh year. And yet when I look back at 2020, I see a lot to celebrate as well. So it has been harsh and let's not pretend that it hasn't been, um, but there's been a lot of success. And I'm gonna talk about just one project amongst many, you know, Brian's talked about peer, we've heard about involvements with UPATI, all the great things that Melanie's been doing with Stop AFib. And that's true of all of you that are on this call is that we've managed to progress things even in spite of this year, we've found new ways of working. But I'm gonna to talk to you about a project called Paradigm. And Paradigm couldn't have really happened without UPATI. So I'm really glad that Maria was on this call to talk about UPATI. Because as patients were, um, were becoming educated to go through the UPATI system, we realized that we need the other stakeholders to be ready to seek their advice. So, so, so it's no good having lots and lots of people trained to be patient experts if the doors are closed. And so Paradigm was an international effort involving many stakeholders. It was a 30 month project to deliver tools and guidances on patient involvement in medicines development. And when I look back over the last year, especially with COVID, I'm very proud that so many people worked together to deliver this on time um, to a really high quality. So it's an innovative medicines initiative project. And for those of you that don't know, that means that it's part funded by the European Commission in Europe. And it also has a lot of involvement from the um, uh, pharmaceutical industry in Europe as well. Um, so the members of the consortium included patient groups, the industry, academia, regulators and HTAs. And the goal was really to create tools and guidances um, for patient engagement um, to really help other stakeholders, not just the patient organizations, but the other stakeholders involved as well, um, get better and more systematic at having patient involvement. And it looked at three specific points in medicines development, setting the research priorities. So right at the beginning of the scientific story, um, clinical study designs, how patients can be involved in that, and early dialogues with regulators and HTAs. And I'm mainly gonna focus on that last point, which is the area that I was most involved in. Um, but first, let me draw your attention to, you know, what came out of this. There, there is a toolbox called the Paradigm Toolbox, which has a wide range of guidances and tools and resources along this subject. It covers things like managing competing interests among different stakeholder groups, what kinds of capabilities should organizations have if they're involving patients in their processes? What kinds, what kinds of guidance can be given or templates can be given around agreements, contracts, non-disclosure agreements that are much more patient friendly? What should the codes of conduct be at this point in time? We have codes of conduct governing patient groups working with industry when medicines have been launched but there's very little said about what the codes of conduct are earlier in that process. And there's a whole section there on community advisory boards. So if your patient organization is thinking of convening and running your own advisory boards that you're in charge of and you control, there's information there, lots of resources there to help you with that. And so there's links in chats, both to the Paradigm Project and to the Toolbox. But let me quickly focus on part of the project that I was most heavily involved in, which was patient engagements in early dialogues with HTA bodies. And so we worked with about 11 HTA agencies across Europe and Canada to develop a whole host of tools to make patient involvement at this, in this particular process much more systematic and much easier for HTA bodies to start doing and then maintain. 
So for those that don't know, what are early dialogues? So early dialogues, sometimes called scientific advice, is a process where the company developing the medicine can confidentially share their plans for their research with regulators or with HTA bodies and get some advice. So to try to find out if what they're planning will meet the needs later down the line of regulators and HTA. And we passionately believe that patients should be involved in this process um, because by involving patients, we believe that improves the quality of the advice given to the medicine developer. And that will eventually lead to the better evidence being generated that really supports the, the, the needs and the experiences of patients. So at this early dialogue time, which is a bit similar to the time point that Brian was talking about, it's years before a medicine is going to come to market. So it's an ideal time to get those insights in and then think about what that means for the evidence that's going to be generated to support that potential new medicine. And so we developed a range of tools. We worked with HCA agencies, with patient groups, with other stakeholders. Um, and the tools are written, I have to say, for HCA bodies, but they're written in very plain language. They're written in Word documents, so they're not PDF, and they're designed to be adapted and used. And we think many of these tools could be adapted and taken up by the patient groups as well. So although they were written initially for HTA bodies, we think they could be adapted for many more stakeholder groups. They have fact sheets that explain early dialogues and the role of patients. There's examples on the kinds of inputs that patients can provide. There's guidance on different ways to involve patients in these early dialogue processes. And there's quite a lot in there about interviewing patients around medicine development. Several HTA bodies use interviews as their interaction method for working with patients. And you'll see there there's, there's discussion guides, there's hints and tips, there's checklists on, on many of these different processes. There's even guidance on the use of video conferencing um, to get these kinds of insights from the patient community into early dialogues. And obviously that became very important during last year. Each tool is only one or two pages long and yet the whole toolkit is over a hundred pages long. So that gives you a sense of just how many tools are within that document. And so to finish, you know, despite the difficult year that 2020 was, I think my experience, my personal experience of working on this project show just what is possible when everybody is passionate about developing something that is really needed, coming up with something that's useful and practical. And I'm already getting feedback from HTA agencies that they're using these tools to improve their processes. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really, I'm really pleased that this worked out so well with so many people involved. And thank you very much. I'll hand back to you, Dave. Thank you, Neil. Um, it's it's uh, amazing how much together all these resources can um, guide, can uh, help us understand. Um, I just wanted to share before we go into the open conversation, one of the things that this program, the COVID Advocacy Exchange will, will have this year is a searchable resource library. So all of these resources that Neil and Melanie and Maria um, and everybody are sharing everything from last year and then what we create going forward will be a part of a searchable resource library so that people all over the world can find what we're doing and learn from it and access all these resources. Um, and I just wanted to share too, uh, I think yesterday we sent out an email to everyone with a summary presentation and uh, just creating this program in 2020, uh, we had 6 million impressions in social media, 25,000 people come to the, the site to check this out and 5,000 people really you know, engaging and reviewing material. And so what we're creating together is really uh, reaching the world and we hope affecting real change. So i um, so grateful to BMS to have um, co-created and founded this and partnered with all of us. And so uh, more to come on that later, um, but the really important thing to dig into, um, and Brian, if you're okay getting us underway, uh, we've designed in 30 minutes as a conversation. And so um, we really want to hear from everybody and make this an informal conversation. You know, what are you doing? What are you seeing? And um, make it a really meaningful dialogue. So, uh, Brian, over to you to get us started. 
Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'll kick it off with a question uh, for, for both the, the speakers on the panel as well as the participants and attendees. I mean, obviously there are a, a number of resources out there that, that both Maria, Melanie and Neil have highlighted for, for the patients and caregivers within the community. Um, there's obviously a lot of opportunities to engage within the medicines development pathway, whether it's providing input into patient uh, needs, unmet needs earlier on in drug development, all the way through to um, engaging with regulatory health authorities, um, policy access issues, even um, when the medicines are approved. I guess I, I would be interested to know from, from your perspective, um, where do you think the, the biggest gap is for patients um, to engage within the entire life cycle of a, medic of a medicine? Where would you like to see patients engage more and, and what can we do either you know, as an individual company or as an industry to, to help support those efforts? So Brian, I can, I can start with, a, with, with an, a challenge that I see that I think is a big challenge that we all need to work together to overcome. And, and that's around trust amongst different stakeholders. So when, when you're talking around uh, patient involvement in clinical trial design, working with the industry, you know, some regulators, for example, say that if you do that, then you can't, you can't be involved in some of the regulatory discussions. So that there's this, that there's a whole issue to be solved, I think, around uh, managing interests. We always use the word conflict of interest, and I don't think it is a conflict. I think we're all trying to solve the same problems and bring the right skills and the right knowledge together. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of work to do with some of the decision-making stakeholders, such as regulators and HTAs, so that they understand why it's important that the patient community is working really closely with the industry. Thanks, Neil. That's a that's a great answer, and and I'll share. I think you know this year I've seen regulatory authorities really request a lot more information from industry on on how we're engaging with the patient and patient advocacy community. You know, I prior to sorry prior to last year I did not see that coming from regulatory authorities, and now they seem to be just asking what what are you doing with the patient community as you're developing the drugs? How have you engaged with them? What sort of input have you gotten? And you know. Luckily, uh, and, and fortunately for BMS, we've been engaging with advocacy groups much earlier in our development programs. Um, but this is, I, I think this has been really a, a big shift in mindset from regulatory authorities that I'm, I'm extremely happy to see. I think it will continue to move forward. Um, and, and the resources to help the patient and, and patient community um, really upscale and, and know how to engage with regulatory authorities will be paramount to, to making this succeed. One of the things that I think is a, a, a challenge is for the pharmaceutical companies that are so big to know who needs to be involved internally to actually access the patient community. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard uh, people say, the FDA said, have you talked to Melanie yet? And um, in many cases, the, the folks that were working on that with the FDA had no idea who the advocates were, much less even who internally could help them get to the advocates. And so I think that sometimes the communication internally can be an obstacle. Um, obviously, that's not happening in BMS because you guys have addressed a lot of that. But in a lot of companies, that is an obstacle. The internal um, silos um, that need to be broken down to actually find out who can engage the advocacy community and bring them to the table. Thanks, Melanie. I'll just add that I, you know while we were able to launch Peer at, at BMS, you know. Even um, though Peer was launched at our CEO town hall, that was for the entire organization, a few months after I did have someone email me and, and say they didn't know patient advocacy existed at BMS and how they could get involved. So, and, and we're probably a, a mid-sized company compared to a lot of the other pharmaceutical companies. And um, I still had someone reaching out, um, which I, I think is great because the, the more they're hearing about the, the company, the organization and industry engaging with patient community and patient advocates, the 
the more excited they are, the more we can include them, the more work that we can do. Um, so I, I think it's great. And, and hopefully other, other companies are, are doing this as well. That's awesome. I, I just like to follow up on something that Neil said. And I, th I, I really believe that the trust is so, so important. And um, I will say, I, I've, I've been working on some projects with metadata in, including the patient voice in clinical trial experience. And actually I was on a, one of the workshops did have a team from BMS. Um, so it was really cool to see that interaction between patient advocates and industry and the software engineers. So, but I think, I think, you know, we, we'd all agree that, you know, building that trust both ways, you know, is super important in, uh, in the patient experience. Thanks, Dave. That, that's extremely useful. And I'll say from a BMS perspective, we're always looking for new opportunities to engage with the patient and patient advocate community. We're doing some really, really amazing things in supporting patient registries that are either run by organizations managing data. Some, some patient organizations also have their own patient registries and, and manage those. Um, looking for inno innovative ways to support patient advocacy organizations that collect um, patient data or patient registries through, through mobile apps or patient reported outcomes through mobile apps. Um, really, really cool stuff that's going on. Um, I think we're also looking at things like uh, digital clinical trial studies and, uh, and uh, ways of um, running clinical trials that are a bit more efficient, um, leveraging use of technology. And a lot of that is um, efforts that we could definitely use input from the patient and patient advocacy community from, on. I can only echo that because I can see that in the within patient education we see also new needs for to cover new areas, uh, digital health, also medical technologies, things like this that are coming uh, more and more as a as a request from the patient side to be also trained in these areas. How can we get involved in, in, in these? Is something, do you have something on big data or, or things that they have come across? And then we, we are really trying to catch up also uh, to bring that knowledge uh, to them. So, and, and we see that this, this is also something interesting that we've seen, especially in the med tech um, um, industries are also getting curious about uh, patient engagement more and more. And so we, we are also expanding to that area. I'm, I'm, I'm Brian, and I just another thought, just thinking about you know the story that's built as we've gone through the, the, this panel, there's a lot of seeming overlap, but it's not overlap. It, it's building on the work that each of us has done uh, and not duplicating that work. And I think that's one of the, I think things that we have to keep concentrating on as we go forward, there's lots of great work being done. I can say that Paradigm really built on the work that you, Pat, you'd already done. A lot of resources were an evolution or, or you know, taking that step further for different stakeholder groups. And, and I can see all of these initiatives happening. And I think one of the things that we'll be challenged with as we move forward over the next year or two is how do these all fit together? And how do we ensure that we're building on the work that's already been done in a way that's additive and positive rather than competitive. And I think, I think, I think that's, that's a challenge that we'll, we'll have to keep revisiting. That's a great point, Neil. And I'll, I'll also uh, uh, shamelessly admit that when we were building Peer, we definitely took a look at Paradigm and UPADI's resources uh, amongst a, a whole host of resources that are out there. To, to frame where peer is today. So it's, it's been incredibly useful. Um, again, not, not duplicative, but re really useful in, in building peer and um, completely understand what you say in terms of the challenges, because uh, as, a, as, as a pharmaceutical industry, um, certainly some of the work that we do is competitive. Um, getting patient input into our medicines um, adds a competitive advantage to our programs. But at the same time, it also helps the rest of industry and, and participating in, in broader working groups, coalitions, with other stakeholders such as patient groups, um, even not non-disease specific patient groups as well. Um, initiatives like, like Paradigm, um, groups like you, Patty, and others is, is incredibly useful and, and really helps to kind of move the entire effort, the movement of, of um, working together with the patient forward. Brian, could I ask a question? Um, sure. 
I, I heard Neil, I forget which session I watched you on, but you were talking about how complex this has all gotten, right? And it's not about changing the way things used to be. It's about keeping up with how things are changing. Do you remember what you were sharing? And, and it just, it affected me so much the way you shared it. I hope I'm remembering the right thing, Dave. You never know. Um, yeah, what's happened, what I see happening, because I work with lots of different stakeholder groups, and I see everybody in their little silos, they might be regulatory or their HTAs, or even for some members of the industry, they're quite rightly so fo focused on how do we do this in our organization? Uh, at the same time, their organizations are changing just naturally, and it's accelerating that their organizations are changing. And so as a patient advocate who is being asked to input into all of these different systems, asked by regulators, can you give us some advice here, um, asked to you know, be involved in some projects or co-creation work there, um, what the feedback we're getting from patient organizations is that is becoming quite disjointed and they're often being asked for the same kinds of information over and over and over again by different organizations. And so the, there's a request that I hear really loud and clear, really from patients involved in HTA processes um, saying, is there a way that we can simplify all of this complexity and, and sort of segment off the non-competitive information so the general information around patient experience of a disease, for example, and have that in a central repository that's accessible by all, accessible by regulators, by HTAs, by companies, by researchers. And, and so that when you're actually invited to give that specific recommendation to a, to a, a HTA body or to a particular company, it is that very specific information that you're giving, not a repeat of the generalized information that you've given a thousand times before. And I'd be interested for the people on, uh, you know, in this session here, whether that's something that they also have heard. Um, it might just be something related to HTA. Neil, I, I can confirm. I think it's, you know, um, something that we've heard uh, across industry as well, um, especially in therapeutic areas where it is competitive and there are a, a ton of um, medicines or options available. You know, getting input from patients um, is, is important, um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm sure that some of the patients or, or patient experts are, are saying the same thing to different companies. So how can we, you know, optimize that? Um, whether it's something like community advisory boards where, where an advocacy group will lead the meeting and share with multiple companies at the same time, um, their perspectives in, in a kind of a, a non-competitive state. I've seen some organizations do that very, very successfully. Uh, would, would love to see more of that and, and also hear um, what the patient advocacy community thinks of, of doing that. Certainly, um, certainly not a easy lift to do those things. And obviously there are companies that are probably um, a bit less willing to, to participate in those types of events because um, they want a competitive advantage or they don't want to, you know, share secrets. But um, there's a way of doing it very compliantly and, and within the uh, parameters of confidentiality so that we're really kind of optimizing and, and getting input from the patient community um, and not being duplicative and, and asking the same patient or patient advocate the, the same question from, from multiple companies. Mm -hmm. It, it's a real challenge for us as patient advocacy organizations because we want to be helpful. We're under NDAs with a number of organizations, so it's kind of walking a tightrope for us. So that's part of the reason that we convened our corporate forum, our corporate membership program, and we bring together our corporate forum members along with patients um, typically the day before our patient conference, and we ask for input from all our corporate forum members as to what are some of the specific questions they would like us to ask patients, and then we will open it up. Um, the information becomes fair game. It, you know, everybody hears the same thing, and that's been really valuable, but we don't get involved in that as much 
in the early days, that typically happens after a product has come to market. Um, it's often more around uh, packaging and package inserts and, you know, how do you make the decision as to what, you know, medication to, to, um, to go on and, and that sort of thing. We would welcome the opportunity to have some of those conversations earlier and to engage in that as part of our corporate forum meetings. Our concern in the past has been that that is competitive information and that there's a great deal of concern about sharing that openly and publicly um, or even gathering information because sometimes the questions can lead to um, some you know, knowledge of where you're thinking of going. And so there's concern about even surfacing some of those questions in front of some of your competitors. But if there's a way to do it without um, leaking competitive information through some of the questions that are asked, then, you know, we would be delighted to um, broker some of those conversations. That's fantastic, Melanie. It is a, uh, a very tricky dance that, that we do as, as industry and as patient groups um, to make sure we're not revealing competitive data, but also getting useful information. Uh, I'll share that, you know, I've sat in on uh, corporate councils, corporate, um, cor corporate industry meetings where an advocacy group will, will convene you know, 10 pharmaceutical companies and ask some of those questions. What are you looking to do um, this year, what are your priorities? And and for the most part, the um, representatives from from the pharmaceutical companies have been very open. Many of whom are within advocacy teams and corporate affairs departments. Um, and not surprisingly, most of the objectives are, are very much aligned. A lot of it is kind of above uh, above above brand, um, so not for their specific asset, but really for the specific condition or disease. And um, I think. Uh, you know, some advocacy groups hold these meetings, certainly not all, but in, in my view, they've been extremely useful. The folks that have experience in advocacy within companies, they, they know what they can say. Um, they know the parameters, they, they have the expertise and um, it's, it's been nothing but, but rewarding. Um, I, I haven't seen any competitive secrets been leaked. Maybe I'm not asking the right questions, um, but uh, it, they've been very useful in, in my mind. I think we have a question from Nancy. Yeah, my question is, so I have, uh, hi Dave, a nonprofit based out of Colorado, we're national in Canada. So we deal with a lot of cancer survivors um, and caregivers. And we've worked with a couple of pharmaceuticals um, to share, you know, to give that patient experience, right, to what we're talking about here. But I also have had some that are like, I don't want to share any information. They're going to sell my data. They're going to, you know, they get nervous on that end in this day. So I'm just kind of curious how that is dealt with. I know that when we have worked with a pharmaceutical, it's in a small group and it stays right there. But if we were to go bigger in offering surveys, that's some of the feedback we have that people are just nervous, like how far beyond is my information gonna be shared? Thanks, Nancy. I, I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll maybe take a stab at it before I turn it over to the, the rest of the panelists. Um, data is a, is a tricky topic. Um, the, the rules and complexities around what can be shared, what can't be shared, um, what people are willing to share is incredibly complex, both US, outside of US, you know, the regulations in Europe and beyond. I think even, even socially um, with the, the big technology companies, what's being shared, what's being not, it's, it's a huge social issue, um, even outside of pharma. And then when you get into health data, Obviously, people are very worried. Um, things like, will companies track my data? Will my employer track my data and you know, potentially discriminate against me in the, in the job field? Huge issues that I think um, we probably don't have all the answers for. But I, I will say I'm a strong uh, supporter of, of data sharing. I, I've um, done a bit of policy work in, in data and electronic health records um, pro probably, uh, probably close to a decade ago now. Um, but I will say you know, the more people that are willing to share data, um, you know, anonymized data uh, within their community with even, or even as healthy volunteers, the more data we get, the further research can move forward and helping people. I mean, if people don't share, it's, it's just tough to, to move forward 
Um, and then, you know, looking at sharing data, it's to me, it's um, very altruistic. It's to help the community, help the patient community, help those around you. Um, I'll say there are also a number of data consortiums that um, pharmaceutical companies participate in. And we actually share data with other companies so that we can all move forward in that therapeutic area. Um, and some of these, these early spaces, there are actually a number of patient advocacy groups that, that do this work, that form consortiums where companies will, will sign um, confidentiality disclosures and share their data with each other to identify um, biomarkers or surrogate markers in that therapeutic area to, to help move that research forward. Obviously, a lot of that is um, in a pre-competitive state and, and very early on, but I think there are a number of examples where, where people are willing to share data. Um, obviously, a, just a com complex topic, but you know, any, yeah, go ahead. It, it is, I was just gonna say, and that would be great information like for me to share in that trust factor. It's like, you know, we always say when we do this, you're helping the next person diagnosed with cancer by sharing your story, um, but for them to truly understand, and most people are more than happy and they don't even think about it, but we have had a handful that are like, I'm not sharing anything. I, you know, I don't want big brother <laughs> you know, in this day and age. So um, I think the more we can kind of educate, you know, how things are used and just that positive marketing forward of, hey, this is for the good. This is for getting rid of cancer or whatever disease state we're talking. But thank you for sharing that because we would love to push this forward and make yeah, a bigger and change. Thanks, Nancy. And, and maybe a, just a quick comment on that. Where would you like to see that information come from? Would it would it be helpful coming from pharma as well as you know patient organizations and, and nonprofit organizations? Because a lot of it is a, a trust issue, credibility issue. It is, and we make it clear that at, with what we do, we we do programs for adult survivors that you know if we do work with somebody, the information stays here. What we do at our programs is meant to be you know that what stays at Epic lives at Epic. Um, but at the same point, what we're talking about is is moving it forward. So I think it's it's that education even more from all, you know from pharma from everybody to say, hey, we need you to be a part of the voice and the research. You know, it's not just the scientists; it is the patient voice that's going to help move things forward. So it just, as we know, it's a it's a sensitive issue right now, but it's been one that's been voiced to us for a long time. I think patients are a lot more comfortable uh, giving their data to patient organizations to then be anonymized before it's used by anyone else. Um, there is a trust that patient organizations um, have built up with their communities and people are much more willing to give uh, their data if they know that they can trust you to keep their information confidential and only pass along the anonymized data. So I think that's an important role for patient organizations. And when we let people know that we're not sharing their name or contact info, um, and they don't even have to provide it, but it's useful for us to know so that we can help aggregate um, their data if it comes in at multiple times or if there's, you know, if, if there's something important that we, that we see where we can help them um, in their um, experience with their disease. So I think that the trust of pa with patient organizations and then our ability to aggregate that data and make it leverageable is, is really an important thing. And can, I, can I just add, add to this? Because this is an issue, Nancy, that came up quite a few years ago for us in HTA, the HTA world, because patient groups who were inputting into HTA processes were often doing surveys of their patient organizations, they were their patient community, and often that was quite sensitive information that they were capturing. And they were using that to, to build the evidence that they needed when they were um, in part of a, a health technology assessment process. And they came to us at HTAI and they said, we have no idea about the ethics of this. And so we worked on a, um, I'll just put it into the chat actually, we worked on a resource, it's not a long resource, 
um, um, with some ethical guidance for, um, for patient groups who are collecting survey information. So this is not about data collection that, that Melanie and Brian, I think you were talking about, but, but much more about when patient organizations are collecting information from their patient community and using that information on with other stakeholders. Um, that was developed, as you can see there, in, in, in 2016. So it's a bit old now, but we had good feedback on, on, on its use. So hopefully that might be something that helps. I think patient organizations need to be extremely careful in what data they collect. In the AFib space, the data is not quite as sensitive as it might be in some of the other disease states. And so being cognizant of what's sensitive to your community is really important. And we try to avoid collecting things that are uh, super sensitive because personally, I wouldn't want to be responsible for any of that data accidentally getting out. So I'm not yeah. going to connect it, collect it if, if it's something that's that sensitive. Yeah, we don't share. We collect very personal because we bring people on outdoor adventure trips. And so we have to have all their meta. We don't, I'm not talking sharing what we have. It's more that, you know, um, connecting someone to a BMS and being confident, you know, and, and making sure they know that it is definitely respected and you can trust this. So that's what I'm talking about. Not per kiss yet. We definitely, like I said, we don't share anything from our records of what we have, unless it's an anonymous survey on the benefits of what we do. That's about as far as it goes with what and we would share publicly. And I would also link this to the way the information is presented to the patients from, from this company side, what kind of language is used, and uh, maybe there also is uh, a possibility for patient involvement in designing that information. And uh, we've seen projects like this um, already. So it could also be then on about the information sharing in a very, um, you know, easily accessible language uh, with examples and and with, with this uh, patient voice really, really there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Mary. I think we have a comment from uh, the audience from Jennifer. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, very inspiring. And um, I think one of the things I want to ask of, of the organizations is that they uh, appreciate the time a person takes to be generous. Um, I heard the word altruism and I, I feel um, organizations need to build capacity for learning they also need to build capacity for listening. Um, one of my favorite things about grit is that little, you know, the little text box in the middle. But the truth is conversation takes time. Um, writing a response in a survey takes time. And, um, and many of us are already, you know, we're parents, we're mothers, we're dealing with healing and, and chemotherapy. And um, I think people are appreciative, are learning to be more appreciative of anonymity, but I, I still think building and capacity inside of organizations for the time it takes to listen and hear, as well as really appreciating the people participating are giving a part of their life away to help support other patients. And I just don't see enough credit being given for that exchange and I'll be quiet now, thank you. I think that's an immensely important comment, uh, Jennifer. Um, I mean, we get, you know, survey fatigue um, within our organization as well, you know, asking how, how meetings went and, and, you know, how, how things are going. I, I myself personally, I try to answer as many surveys as I can because I, I know it is important um, without appropriate feedback and input. It's hard to improve what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, I think when, when I look at surveys, um, I look to see who sent it. And uh, most of the time it's like, hey, I, I like this person. I'm gonna spend as much time to help them improve this as possible. And, and part of that is, is building relationships with the community, with your colleagues. It's so important. You know, um, in the advocacy function, I, I'm cognizant that we ask our advocacy groups that we work with um, questions all the time, um, maybe informal surveys. And, um, you know, part of, I think, uh, why they answer is because of the relationships that we've built with them, the, the trust that we've built with them. It's so integral to, to what we're doing. And I think you're spot on without, you know, the trust and relationship uh, with organizations, with the community, we can't expect them to, you know, 
provide input. I think patients need to feel like they're getting something of value in exchange for what they're providing. And if they feel like someone is listening to them and taking that information seriously, that goes a long ways towards feeling like they're compensated for the time they spend in participating in those surveys and being respectful of their time, minimizing the number of questions, minimizing the amount of work that's involved in doing a survey, I think is really important as well. And we're very uh, cognizant of that. We time the amount of time um, we think it takes to do those things and try to keep um, their keep the request under three to five minutes. Thanks, I'll make a quick comment on that, Melanie. Um, just relating back to peer or patient expert engagement resource, when we get input from, from expert patient advocates on our protocols and things like that, um, I've you know sometimes had development teams send me a full 300 page protocol and say, hey, can, can one of your expert patients review this? And I look at it and I'm like, what the heck? I don't wanna read this. Can you just, um, Let's, let's be fair to the expert patient advocates and point out the areas that we need their input. Is it the inclusion exclusion criteria? Is it the patient reported outcomes tools? Is it specifically on this point within the exclusion criteria? Um, you know, where do we really need their input? Um, so yeah, don't send me a 300 page protocol because that's not gonna fly with me or the patient advocate. Um, and, and then the second piece is, you know, even with peer, we make sure that we appreciate their input in, in a couple ways. One is that we appropriately compensate the patient experts. Um, obviously those reimbursement rates are, are different in each market, but we're working very closely with our legal contracting team to make sure it's appropriate and, and um, as consistent as possible within industry and, and across their space so that we recognize the expertise that these advocates are, are providing and input to our programs. Um, and then the, the other piece is I always, always strongly recommend and, and kind of nag our development teams that, you know, whatever input they're receiving, are we taking it and to follow up with the expert advocates because they, they need the follow up to know, you know, what advice is being taken, what is not being taken, why or why not. We believe in the honesty and, and transparency um, the advocates, the expert advocates are under confidentiality. So we can be as honest as we can with them um, and their experience where, you know, they understand why or why we can't take uh, any, any certain pieces of advice. You know, they're, they're um, part of the experts in this field. So no need to, uh, to, to baby them or, or to not be transparent, and honest with them. And um, that's, I think uh, what I would expect um, and, and how advocacy organizations uh, engage with their patients as well and their patient communities, being, being honest and, and building those relationships and um, being appreciative. We in the patient community greatly value when researchers come back to us and tell us how our input was used and what results they got as a result of that. So that's something that for us is a valuable exchange. We're willing to do that if we know that we're going to hear um, feedback as to how it was used. I wanted to um, chime in really quick. This is Lauren Listowskis. I'm the program director at Grit Health. And everything you guys are talking about is so relevant. Uh, I'm a cervical cancer survivor myself. And Patients are hesitant to participate in research, whether it's clinical trials or patient experience studies. And something that is near and dear to my heart is, you know, we recruit these people or we have people give their experience and their feedback and input, but how are we following up with them? Melanie, just what you said, you know, if I fill out a survey as a patient, I want to know what is that going towards? Who is that helping? You know, what are the results at the end of the day, whether it's a year from now, five years from now, or a decade from now, you know, that like Jen, you said, um, we are giving our time to do this. And so we really want to know what's happening. And um, so that's something we really pride ourselves on at GRIT and the research that we do through the GRIT project. And I'm really excited. We actually have a program tonight kind of revolving around this topic um, at Grit Health for a research study we helped conduct 
with a pharma company. And tonight, two of the researchers and our chief research officer from GRIT were actually having an hour long Zoom meeting. And we invited all the participants that participated in the research to attend and learn and hear from them directly about how did this idea come about? Why did we do it? And go over the results in a patient friendly way using that language, Kristen, that you mentioned, that's so important and actually get to tell them, okay, this is what you told us as patients. This is what we're doing with it. And this is what we're gonna do with it over the next few years. And I think that is just, that should be the standard, you know? So I wanted to share that and I'll drop the link for it in the chat as well. Thanks, I appreciate that input. I'll maybe share a quick anecdote. Um, when I was doing some uh, policy work within the uh, Department of Health and Human Services at, at California, um, I was tasked with doing a survey around electronic health records and, and policies. And um, I had to call each individual DHHS uh, official within each state uh, in the U United States. and. Um, almost every single one agreed to participate in my survey on, on policy research because I, you know, what my promise with, to them was that I would share the results. And um, true to my word, I, you know, once the publication was, um, once the research was published, I shared it with every single state. I think Ohio, except for Ohio, they declined to um, participate in my survey. Um, I, I may have actually shared the result with them, but they were the only state that declined uh, to participate in the research for, for whatever reason. Um, so, I mean, I think the follow-up is incredibly important in, in everything that we do with the patient community as, as part of this ecosystem, um, because it's the feedback loops that help us um, do better as, as a community, as, as industry. It's, it's how we move research forward. Yeah, and I think it also, it goes back to that trust issue as well, right? That, that open communication. I love, Lauren, I love that idea of getting the people back you know, and, and it, mo most importantly, I think what you said was it, making it patient friendly, you know, so it's, they can really understand it, you know, uh, what it meant. So good job. Thanks, Dave. So I think we'll, we'll turn it over to Dave. Um, if we're, I think, uh, Dave, you're on, you're on the agenda. <laughs> I am, and I didn't want the conversation to end. Um, uh, I think about when I was trying to learn about all this 10 years ago, just feeling so lost and wishing I had conversations like this to feel more a part of it and connected. Um, before we move into Maria sharing more about your resource, um, can I ask, is there anybody with us that's newer in this and maybe learning about patient voice or any of these things for the first time. What's it like for you to hear from people that are living this or doing it? If anybody's comfortable to share, I'd love to hear what it's like. Anybody feel courageous to jump in? Okay, um, I'll share my perspective. Um, it's uh, daunting to try to understand what this is all about. And Maria, um, you're going to share with us in just a second a resource that you've developed. And you know, the more we create these tools, and you know, Neil, I heard you talk about the tools and the toolkits and things. Um, I really hope that that we keep elevating all these things so that as more individuals want to be a part of this and want to contribute, um, they they know where to go and how to learn. And so, uh, Maria, please share more about your resource and what you're doing. You, Patty's doing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for this fascinating discussion. What I would like to bring um, up is the uh, the work we have been doing, uh, enhancing our e-learning. And so what we have done now is we have launched a new learn online learning platform called the UPATI Open Classroom. And the, the, um, the address is learning.upati.eu. And it's an open flat platform for everyone to access now the materials that are uh, part of the um, expert training course. So um, 
please be uh, welcome and explore this platform uh, the content is free and accessible online and you can um, choose and pick and choose the topics you are interested in um, and and start your learning journey and also there is the possibility of finalizing the full course online and becoming a UPATI fellow um, in order to graduate there are two um, online um, streamed uh, workshops that are uh, in addition to the online learning modules um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about the content or the platform. So this, this is now freely available. We are still working on adding more content onto this platform, but um, it's, it's almost finalized now and uh, accessible. Maria, what's, what's a goal? Do we, um, how, how can we make sure we let people know about it this year? Yes, we started um, a promotion campaign in December and um, I can send you uh, those social media posts through that we can, there's a nice video that uh, you're welcome to share uh, about the platform, a, a brief video that explains what it is and what we can, how we can benefit you. Um, indeed, so you're open to share this with all of your networks and uh, we really hope to reach more and more expert patients who want to to get training and it's it's um, also not just to become you party fellows but to to go into those topics that uh, are really of interest and read up on let's say um involvement in clinical trials or another topic, maybe ethical issues or, or anything that uh, is, is of, of interest. So it really opens up those individual pathways for learning that were not uh, uh, available before. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, we'll keep sharing, Maria, that resource and everything that Neil and Melanie and uh, everybody mentioned will be a part of the program. Um, before I have a few wrap up comments, uh, can we give a big thank you to Melanie and Neil and Maria and Brian for sharing your expertise? Please throw in the chat clap or uh, clap. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you uh, for, for inspiring the session, Melanie, and for everybody sharing your expertise. Um, it's, it's humbling to be a part of it. Um, I just want to share before we wrap up that um, the, um, the feedback from COVID advocacy members this year is overwhelmingly that we want to be a part of real change. And with the issues we've talked, around, talked about around health equity and disparities and patient voice um, and the future of advocacy, these are topics that um, everybody who shared feedback has said, we want to be a part of change and we want to be a part of really assessing the change. What are we creating and how is advocacy driving it forward and how are we co-creating? And so based on your feedback, everybody that shared responses, we've identified four areas that we're gonna create working groups around. And so those four areas, uh, two are health equity focused. Um, the first one is ethnic and racial disparities. The second area is accessibility, um, accessing care. Um, the third area is patient voice, patient focused drug development. And of course in Europe, it's patient focused medicines development. So that's a third topic area. And then the fourth is really the future of advocacy and how is advocacy changing to continue driving change the way everybody today shared and involving patients to do more. So uh, if you've already said you wanna be a part of one of those groups, thank you. Uh, next month's session, and we're gonna send information out about, will be the first time we're gonna break into working groups. So we'll break into four working groups. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat so I'm Dave at grithealth.com. If I can ask anybody that wants to sign up to be a part of any of those four, just send me an email and I'll make sure you get added to the list. Um, next month, if you show up, uh, we're gonna uh, have people choose which breakout rooms they wanna go into. So you can jump into a specific breakout next month. Um, and the calendar this year for 2021 will revolve around 
identifying the change that we want in each of these areas, identifying the goal or how we're going to get there. And then by the end of the year, really creating outcomes that we can share. Uh, Brian, I think what you shared with BMS is really a model how the advocate voice is changing the healthcare medicines development process. So what are the areas that we are going to be a part of creating change like this in the future? So um, it has been an honor to spend this time together with everybody to start our year off with inspiration. Um, who feels inspired to share a closing comment? Can I ask any of our speakers or anybody that wants to jump in and uh, bring us home? Thanks, Dave. Maybe I'll, I'll open it. Um, just incredibly inspired to, to hear from everyone on this call, from the speakers and, and panelists to the participants. Um, there is so much more we can we can do for the patient community. Um, obviously, everything we're doing is moving those efforts forward, but there's just so much work to be done. And um, I think I think Melanie commented uh, in the comment section, but Dave, I would love to be part of all of those <laughs> work streams and working groups if, if possible. Um, just, just appreciate the, the time so much today and everyone for, for staying on it and listening and participating. Truly inspiring. If I can add something, it has been a privilege today to celebrate what's been done. And I look forward to the end of the year when we can celebrate what we have done this year. Perfect comment, Melanie. Thank you so much. And I just want to share my gratitude to BMS for making this program possible and bringing us all together and being such a believer in putting patients first in everything you do. Um, I know Kathy's on and Jody and Lodi, um, Uma, Mariah, I saw Chad, uh, Brian, thank you so much for leading this. Uh, just real gratitude for bringing all of us together. So happy new year, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>